Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Tonight, a political maverick takes the reins of the world's most powerful country. Our news not organization, you, not can you. you give us a chance? You're, can you give us a question? Don't be You're rude. attacking us. They categorize you are fake you. news. He's promised to make America great again. It's him allowing the working class to come back and continue to work. But will he leave it more divided? I don't want someone who is hateful and divisive to be our chief. And what does it mean for the rest of us? There's no more back of the queue for Britain. Good evening and welcome to The Tonight programme. Tomorrow, Donald Trump becomes the President of the United States. He's already warning that it'll be a presidency like no other. But away from the political intrigue, Robert Moore has been speaking to Americans thrilled at the prospect of what they see as a truth-speaking outsider at the helm and others who believe that the nation's character is at risk and that America is now embarking on its greatest gamble. For Americans, the inauguration of a president is a moment of majesty. I, John Fitzgerald Kennedy, do solemnly swear. A richly symbolic transfer of power. I will to the best of my ability. An affirmation that American democracy is safe. Preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. A moment in time that captures the vaulting ambition of the world's dominant power. If not what America will do for you, but what together we can do for the freedom of man. Tomorrow, in the footsteps of giants, Donald John Trump will become America's 45th president. There is currently a febrile, even frenzied atmosphere here. Did a Russian intelligence operation really win Trump the election? Is the Republic even safe in his hands? In all of my years as a reporter, I never imagined I would need to pose this question to an incoming American president. Go ahead. Would a reasonable observer say that you are potentially vulnerable to blackmail by Russia or by its intelligence agency? Does anyone really believe that story? The truth is, many Americans don't know what to believe. I have been reporting on Donald Trump now for more than 18 months, and he remains an almost complete riddle. He is the billionaire with a rare intuition of the American working class. He is the New Yorker who resonates in the heartland. He is a liberal who became a maverick conservative. So where will he now take this magnificent but deeply divided nation. And what impact will a Trump White House have on Britain and the world? One man arguably knows him better than any other foreign politician. He is remarkably good with people and charming with people if he's interested in them. And if he's not, he says what he thinks. Some of the most influential Washington insiders say they've simply no idea where Trump will take America. Is he a New York businessman with thoughtful socialite elite friends and doesn't really have a political ideology? Or is he a scary narcissistic demagogue who will empower the most dangerous radical notions in this country? Who knows? The Trump phenomenon gathered momentum a full year ago in Iowa during the first Republican contest. In small towns on the frozen prairies, Trump found his authentic, distinctive, sometimes crude voice. When I call, they kiss my ass, OK? It's true. They kiss my ass. One voter who found Trump compelling 
was Stan Morse, a Heartland patriot who was politically adrift and looking for a new type of leader. This country was set up for a citizen government, and, and that citizen government has gone by the wayside, and it's time to get it back again. Today, Stan is buying a new flag in preparation for the inauguration, relishing the prospect of his president being a political novice. Some of the criticisms that we hear is that he's never been in politics before, and I believe that that is 100% a positive. I'm ready to have businessmen take over and CEOs. And I think it's a brilliant move. For the entire eight years of the Obama presidency, he has kept his flag at half-mast. In mourning for the country he felt he had lost, now he is ready to raise it again. We need to have our pride back. It's OK to say, this is the United States of America, and we're proud of it. We've got to take our country back. Very simple. But what Stan finds so mesmerizing, others find genuinely and profoundly frightening. I'd like to punch him in the face, I'll tell you. To liberals, Trump's rhetoric is offensive, intolerant, even un-American. Uh, I don't know what I said, ah! Uh. And they have watched his rise to the White House in a state of disbelief. Anne Goldberg, a life coach and motivational speaker, and Laura Guy, an estate agent, describe themselves as quite literally grieving. I'm just, I'm disappointed and like Anne, I'm scared about what might happen. I feel he's a danger. He's not even the president yet. And he's reaching out to other world leaders, taunting them on social media, skipping security briefings, and then hanging out with Kanye, and then hanging out on Twitter. I just, this doesn't make for, this is not presidential material we're working with here. Laura, you're clearly distressed. It's very personal to you. I mean, we've gotten used to watching him on reality TV and now it's all of our reality. I, I, I actually start to have panic attacks. So I don't watch the news anymore because it's too scary for me. I literally can't catch my breath and I start to get a panic, an absolute panic. But for their friend, Rabbi Shoni Labovitz, the political shock is a warning that Americans have become strangers in their own land. There was a large portion of this country that voted for him and there is a reason and let's find out why and let's understand maybe the people that are on the coasts of our country don't really understand the people that that are the farmers and the workers and the people in the middle of the country here in williamson in west virginia deep in coal country trump's promises suddenly come alive if I win, we're going to bring those miners back. You're going to be so proud of your president. You're going to be so proud of your country. You watch. We're going to open the mine. The town is quiet, aggrieved, sullen. When you come here, you realize how much expectation is invested in him. For jobs and morale have hemorrhaged amid automation, trade deals, and an energy revolution. Bo Copley, a devout family man with three children, was one of 7,000 miners who lost their jobs in 2015. He asks to pray with me before we talk. Heavenly Father, I just praise you and thank you for the opportunity to meet with Robert. I pray, Heavenly Father, God, that you would help him, Lord, to report with uh, fairness, Lord, and, and an unbiased, Lord, and we give you the glory and the praise for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. During the election campaign, he famously confronted Hillary Clinton. I just want to know how you can say you're going to put a lot of coal miners out of, out of jobs and then come in here and tell us how you're going to be our friend because those people out there don't see you as a friend. I know that, Bo. Not everyone's version of the American dream is to be filthy rich. You know, for a lot of people here, the American dream is to be able to get up, go to work, 
earn an honest living and come home to your family. There's a lot of cynics out there who say, look, Trump just was like a magician. He just put a spell over you guys that he, he can do nothing as president to bring back the coal industry. This is global forces. He's lying to you, basically. If he lets you down But now, if he lets you down, then what do you do? I mean, yes, everyone's going to be disappointed. I mean... You'll have nowhere else to turn. Hey, well, I have God. I will turn to God and I will go whatever direction God tells me to, and, and I will never lose hope in that. Technological innovation has given businesses and, and uh, utility customers alternatives to dirty, unhealthy coal. And I don't see that changing. And I think that Trump telling miners that they're going to get their jobs back, that the industry's going to be revived, is a terrible, terrible lie to them. Politicians around the world are closely watching whether Trump's protectionist and populist policies will actually work. I think the absolute key test for him is to bring jobs back into those areas. And I'll tell you what's fascinating, even before he's become president, there are companies announcing another 700 jobs here, a factory saved there. I genuinely think he's gonna be the champion of ordinary American people. Talk in this community is not of Russian plots to hack the election, but of signs they've seen of a slight revival of freight trains and of coal trucks on the move. This group of local miners, many out of work, who meet once a week to keep up their spirits, attribute it already to Trump's victory. We've got a lot of coal mines getting ready to start opening up around here. You know, it, uh, there was one up in McDowell County looking for 300 men. There's other coal companies around here that's getting ready to start up. Uh, he's going to give us a shot at being able to put our people back to work. Are you telling me um, that even since his election, you're seeing detecting the first rays of hope? The rays of hope because you see people out here willing to invest millions of dollars in these coal mines. Doing it, it's him allowing the working class to come back and continue to work. And, and it's up to us to do it. But yeah. I think he's going to give us the chance yeah. to do it, whereas we have not been given the chance the past eight years. It sounds to me like you feel like with him in the White House, America is a team again. Absolutely. It's looking more like a team than it has the past eight years. Anything he does will be better than what we've had. Absolutely. Anything. If he flops completely on his face, it'd be better than what we had. We can't go any lower than we went. You know, I'm surprised. You're telling me that even if he fails, you're not too bothered about that because what you want from him is just kind of confront the system. I want to see something different from what we've had, completely different. We've got hope. I would love to meet the man sitting right here and talk to him and just say thank you personally thank you for hope i know you're going to try and we'll try to work with you if we have the opportunity what i'm learning here in coal country is that many workers do not expect miracles they are proud they are patient they will give donald trump plenty of time to deliver and even if he struggles they are more likely to blame congress the media the system in fact anyone but Trump himself. But will other Trump supporters also give him the benefit of the doubt? I have traveled 1,000 miles south to find out. From the white working class of Appalachia to the dizzying diversity of Miami. Here I want to understand another feature of Trump's success that even today still baffles me. How on earth did nearly 30% of Hispanics vote for him, even as he mocked, insulted, and belittled them? Around here, there's uh, an exhibition art called Cuba Ocho. Andre Albuquerque is a tour guide in Miami's Little Havana. He has gone from being a Cuban communist to an American Trump voting Republican. Quite a journey. And unlike those miners, he's putting Trump on notice, even though he shares the president-elect's suspicions. 
He said that China was cheating. Isn't it? China is cheating. He said that there's a lot of uh, bad hombres, bad men, and bad women, by the way, coming through the southern border, that we have to put a stop to it, that we have the right to protect our borders. That is true. He said that we sign a lot of treaties like NAFTA and the TTP, in which American jobs are getting sent to Mexico. And that is true. So the concerns of white working class Americans were also the concern of Hispanic Americans and of African Americans. Of course. I'm all for the minorities. Look at me. I'm a black person, black Hispanic. I mean, I'm as minority as you can be. I took the chance. Let's see what happens. But believe me, I won't remain silent if he loves us up. Your message to the president-elect is, good luck, but boy, I'm going to be watching you. You don't have a blind check. And you better deliver. And you better deliver, man, because otherwise you're going to be there for only four years. <laughs> but others warn that even a single Trump term can do enormous damage here in Florida and around the world. This state is in the crosshairs of an expected increase in extreme weather events and is exceptionally vulnerable to the rising sea levels associated with global warming. Roads are still closed even after the water has receded. We're gonna go underwater. All the coastal communities of the eastern seaboard are slated to go underwater. Philip Stollard may be the only mayor in America who is also a professor of biology. To him, it's a scandal of major proportions that Trump's cabinet picks include climate change skeptics, even outright deniers. Right now, we can't stop bad things from happening, but we have a choice. We have a choice between bad and very, very, very bad. And Trump's nominations are the people who are going to make it very, very, very bad. We are at the cusp of the most critical moment if we don't make radical changes right now in carbon emissions, then we set into motion rapid changes that will happen too fast for us to adapt. And at that point, we're in serious trouble. So the thing we can change is the time scale. Mr. Mayor, if there is a policy in Washington which turns a blind eye to the impact of climate change, how cataclysmic is that? Right. I mean, there's things that are just so um, bizarrely bad that I have a hard time getting my head on them. Uh, so I don't live in a state of denial, rather I focus on the things that I can change. And I think where we're going to have to go is, um, for people like me in municipal government, we have to create our own economic policies. And we have to do it ourselves by whatever means we can, because we're not going to get any help from upstairs. L'accord de Paris pour le climat est accepté. The Paris Climate Change Agreement, signed just over a year ago, is one of the global treaties that Trump has threatened to discard. It is a time of unique challenges. According to Sir Peter Westmacott, until recently Britain's ambassador to the United States. If he walks away from the Paris Agreement on climate change, yeah. if, he, if he walks away or tears up the Iranian nuclear deal, if he cozies up to Vladimir Putin, Peter, what do we actually do about that? Are we going to stand up for our values and say to Donald Trump, you know, this is not acceptable, these, these are not British values, or, or dare we not do that in this day and well, age? Well, I would hope we will do that. Uh, we have seen in the room, for example, Angela Merkel had no compunction at all about saying, I look forward to working you on the basis of a number of values. I would very much hope that the rest of us would also stand up for our values and say that this is not acceptable. Particularly with Vladimir Putin? Particularly with Vladimir Putin. Um, Vladimir Putin has done a number of things which the rest of us regard as you know, dishonest uh, and, and reckless and illegal uh, in that part of the world. Trump has been, I won't say an apologist for Vladimir Putin, but he's been pretty understanding of a number of the positions uh, that Putin has taken. For seasoned diplomats like Sir Peter, Trump's use of social media is startling. How does the British government deal with a president who isn't kind of going through the regular kind of policy system? who's revealing kind of random policies through Facebook and through Twitter. Well, it isn't just a challenge for 
a foreign embassy uh, or government. It's also a challenge for the American administrative system. Uh, and clearly things have been said and then tweeted out which have surprised an awful lot of people in the Washington system, never mind the, the foreigners and the allies. Now, for the rest of us, I think for the time being, we just have to say, well, uh, that's what he's like. But if Trump's tweets are bizarre to some, his former campaign manager sees them as political artillery, a major asset going forward. His Twitter account might be construed as the most powerful weapon in, in the world. That's the power that he now possesses. He understands the importance of that. He understands what that means on the global scale and what it means uh, domestically. But it also means it gives him the opportunity to bypass the mainstream media and go right to the people with his message. That's a powerful tool that no president has ever actually had the opportunity to use. Remember, anything is possible if enough decent people are prepared to stand up against the establishment. Nigel Farage, of course, is in Trump's camp, seeing opportunity ahead where others see potential disaster. There's no more back of the queue for Britain. In fact, I think we've got an amazing opportunity to be at the front of the queue. And I think that would be a very good thing for trade, jobs and investment for both countries. What no one doubts is that just before noon here tomorrow, once Trump is sworn in, America begins its journey into the unknown. It is a real world stress test for America's very system of government. For all the genius of its constitutional arrangements, America was not prepared for this. A maverick, a nationalist, an iconoclast, with no political experience at all, becoming president. For Stan, that is a political revolution to celebrate. He has just raised that flag he purchased. America is great. Other countries can think they're great too. That's, that's their right. But we need to be able to think we're great again. For Laura and for Anne, tomorrow is a moment of peril, amounting to a national emergency. This isn't the country I want to live in. I don't want someone who is hateful and divisive to be our chief. It's scarier as it gets closer. When he's actually president, it's, it's just terrifying. For some, this is a country reborn. For others, the US is turning its back on the very values that made it great in the first place, abruptly ending the American century. In just a few hours, America's greatest gamble will begin.